Good morning and welcome to Arminos webinar, Equity Management, Save Time and Money with Automation and Outsourcing. This is Mary Tressel and we are grateful that you have joined us today. First, I want to go over how to use your webinar pane. In the upper right hand corner of your screen, you'll see a small orange arrow. If you'd like to enter in a question for our presenters at any time during the webinar, just expand that box by clicking on the orange arrow. Type in your question. We will review those questions as time allows at the end of the webinar and uh, make sure that you hit the send button so that our staff can see it. Also, make sure that you are using the correct audio settings so you don't get any echo feedback. If you've called in on your telephone, select the telephone button. If you are using your computer mic and speakers, please click, click on that button. And this is a CE eligible webinar. So to qualify for the CE, you must be using your personal computer and log in with your own information and your unique URL invite to the uh, webinar. You need to be logged into our online software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame of the webinar. You need to actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions and then complete our evaluation survey at the end of the webinar. And please do note that we will send you your slides and your certificate for CE within three business days after today's webinar. So our first presenter is Gil Cito. He is a manager at Armneo for our equity management solutions practice. He's been consulting and managing equity plans for both public and private companies for the last 17 years. And prior to joining Armino, Gil was the head of equity management at various accounting and software companies. Nikki Rahimi is a consultant in our equity management solutions team. She started her career in software development and she worked at IBM for more than 10 years. She then made a career shift and joined KPM and KPMG as an audit associate. She now has worked with several clients of Armino's to implement their stock plans on cloud solutions. She completes stock-based compensation calculations, and she supports them through our full outsource solution. And finally, we have Yusuf Bahu, and he's a consultant with Equity Management Solutions team. He started his career in the finance sector as five years as an investment banker with Wells Fargo and a financial advisor with Valak. After returning to school to get his accounting credentials, he spent the last five years in tax audit and now he is a great consultant on our team and uh, specializes in working on equity accounting, support, and financial reporting. During today's webinar, you will learn how to recognize the pitfalls around equity compensation administration, analyze tips to better manage your equity program, and identify ways to manage the impact of growing and shrinking headcounts on your equity program as your organization adjusts to today's economic realities. Well, during the webinar today, we will present real and hypothetical common equity issues through a framework of actual client case studies. We'll provide additional solutions and actions to mitigate, mitigate risk and increase efficiency. And we'll also give a brief overview of Omnio's equity services. And with that, we're going to start right off with a polling question. So here's your first chance to participate. We'd like to make sure that everybody does respond. Um, to the questions we put up so you make sure you get your CE credit. So are you using software to manage your equity program? And if yes, which software? So um, the op options for you to respond are no software, certain, another software program, or you're not sure which software program you might be using. So we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to vote. So we're going to leave this open for just a couple more seconds here. And we will go ahead and close that poll and share with you with the results. So Gil, interestingly, we yeah. have about half the folks that uh, are not using software at all to manage their equity program, and then just over half are using certain or other solutions. Yeah, that's a very good feedback. So thank you for submitting the, the responses, folks. And uh, just to let you know, we have four questions today. So in order to get the CEP credits, you'll have to answer at least three of them. And, uh, you know, very typical that we do see a lot of scenarios where, you know, depending on the size of the companies, they are not currently using a software. And, um, you know, as we speak today and, and, and talk more about the details today, I think you'll really shine a light on showing, 
uh, showing companies or people why it's a benefit to use the software from a from a not the, or utilizing the power of the software and also from just saving time. Um, and that's interesting. And um, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, one of the things that um, that's very interesting is kind of the statement that we have on on the on the presentation here that equity is one of the most complex operational areas for companies to manage. It's it's really one of those items where it's a love hate relationship where companies know that they need to have an equity program to attract talent and, re and retain talent, but it's also a pain in the butt to manage it. And a lot of a lot of companies don't have the resources or the or the talent necessary to properly manage an equity program. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult because is because, you know, with equity programs, it really crosses a, a, a broad array of, of talents and departments and skill sets of what you would typically need to manage and, and run an equity program. A lot of companies will have their their equity management programs either reside in an HR group or within the legal, but there's a lot of coordinations going on between the, uh, between the departments and the individuals that are servicing the equity programs really need to have that, that diverse background where they can work with different people, have the accounting knowledge and the process knowledge to do stuff that is very specialized to equity. And then also on top of that, be a real good people person where they can communicate and speak with the executives and speak with your, your participants about their equity programs. So one of the things that we see um, characteristics wise from a poorly ran or an insufficient, uh, inefficient equity program is fragmented processes where there's really no communications or lack of communications across the various departments as I spoke. You know, a lot of times the equity programs are designed and, and, and registered obviously by legal or through a law firm, but then it's really up to, you know, the, the HR folks to really administer it and, and run the programs. So there's gotta be a very good sense of communications and, and workflow balance between the two to make sure that everyone stays coordinated. Uh, another thing that we also see quite a bit of, especially in the private market space, is with 409A valuations, where obviously with the 409A valuation, it's it's not an HR function, but the function that but the 409A function falls under really a legal or finance finance capacity, and and but that information is vital for HR to be able to to figure out what the, the strike price is and whatnot and process exercises and uh, a lot of a lot of back and forth going between that. And especially now what we're seeing is a lot of irregular um, filings for the 409A. They're not always scheduled on a one year mark. Um, it happens quite quite um, kind of more frequently now dependent on funding rate uh, funding rounds and just just material changes within the company. And some of the consequences that we're seeing quite a bit is um, with 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 the inconsistent of the 409A, as, as I mentioned, is is just that communications and getting the right stock price and processing the information, and because of that information um, not being accurate, um, obviously it makes a big difference on your cap table, and and having that information correct is very vital for other other functions within the company. Um, one of the one of the higher thing, uh, one of the other scenarios that are consequences that we see is um, uh, having the wrong staff doing the right the right information or doing the wrong job. So a lot of times there'll be very mission critical or very company critical um, information with, uh, regarding the equity program that's that's handled by uh, a lower level employee where there's a really high risk to the information. Or the other aspect is having a CFO, for example, doing stock plan administration work, which which would be a waste of his or her time. Uh, again, to just continue with some of the common pro issues that we see is a lot of times it's with processes. There's a lot of process inefficiencies um, that we can work with to help you with. Uh, back to the survey, a lot of companies are still using uh, software, using uh, uh, 
Excel, for example, to do their stock administrations, which, which in itself will work, but um, again, not the most efficient use of your time or efforts. And then uh, again, assuming that your history of the company or the history of the company is accurate and that it doesn't need any cleanup is always an issue that we run into when we speak with prospects and clients in regards to how clean their data is. Um, lack of bandwidth and skill set, again, as I mentioned, um, having the wrong individuals doing the task might not be the most uh, time efficient uh, way of doing things. And then also just planning ahead, looking at the maybe one year, five year, 10 year out, making sure that you know you have the processes and, and the planning in place to you know to 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 manage your equity program as your as the company grows or changes. And then especially if you go international, um, does your equity plan allow for internationals, you know, sub plans and whatnot and, and working and, and working with us to make sure that we, we consider and, and look at these items at, as the company moves along. So dating myself a little bit, one of the things that I always like to say to my prospects and to my clients is um, really coming out from Jerry Maguire, came out, movie came out in 1996. So I don't know if uh, everyone's seen the movie, but I think this phrase really stands out to me, which is help me help you. And obviously I'm not going to say it the way Tom Cruise said it, but uh, it really does make sense to me as I speak to my clients is how can you help me so I can help you make a better process and make your lives easier. So with that, I want to go ahead and move on to uh, the four cases that we have prepared for you today. Uh, Yusuf, uh, why don't you go ahead and talk about case study number one? We'll do. Uh, thanks, Gil. So before we even kind of dive into the first case study, just wanted to reiterate some of the items Gil has already uh, talked about and some of the common issues that we've kind of discovered over the years of providing support. Um, but the first bullet point to me is probably far far and away the, the most important, and, that, and that's communication and coordination. Um, with communication, I don't think it's it, – on the onset, it's not really given the – the attention out of the gate that it, you know, that it deserves. Um, I like to compare it to other industries where they're always worried about their softwares or programs kind of being in sync and communicating and talking to each other, kind of simplifying the the process. The, the communication between departments within the equity sector is just as important. And it's, you know, once you first get started, you don't really realize – um, how many departments ha have their hand in, in the cookie jar um, at the same time, you know, where, where we're going to need the, the finance and HR and payroll all to kind of work in sync. And um, just kind of setting the standard up front for communication is really important. Right, especially if the departments have multiple roles or that the person in those roles have multiple jobs where they're dealing where – for example, payroll is running payroll and doing benefits and all these other items. And a lot of times these things kind of fall through the crack. Exactly. I think that leads us to kind of the second point is just setting the standard up front, setting expectations and um, documenting what everyone's role will be. Um, and that allows you to kind of create, I guess, a fluidity through through the departments and allow them to know what they're what's expected of them. Right. Having a, a really good written set of procedures, obviously, will be a living document because things change as time goes on. But I think having a written set of documents to really have your, your folks know roles and responsibilities and also, you know, understanding timing of when things are due is very critical in this process. And within this, it kind of allows people to understand what everyone else is doing at the same time instead of a siloed approach where everyone has their own specific role and doesn't really understand what's, you know, what the what the big picture really is. Um, some of these examples under um, the third bullet point are, are good ideas or good examples of what uh, we're looking for. So when there's new hires and, you know, they're not in the board minutes, that's just a form of lack of communication um, where, you know, the board doesn't get uh, notified if someone's been hired and if the hiring package has been issued. Well, the raw hire date, which is a very common issue that we see. Agreed. Um, an another example is probably the 
the plan administrator getting notified of um, new hirees or grants or exercises. Uh, again, back to communication, just set, setting the standard up front of when something needs to be notified and um, who, who is going to be kind of delivering the, the news to the plan administrator. Um, another, another example would be option ease, um, getting the communication of when the, the grants have been issued, um, when things need to be signed. Again, communication isn't only within the company, but also external communication. When you're going to be reaching out to your employees and letting them know that things need to be documented, signed, and, and move forward. Right. A lot of times an employee, typically within a private company, for example, will will think that they automatically receive their stock options on the date of their hire. Um, typically, that's not the case. Typically, when, when a new employee is hired, um, they're, in their employment contract, it might say they might be eligible for a stock option grant, but that stock option grant might not be actually granted until the next board meeting. So that could happen, again, depending on when that individual is hired, it might not happen for a month or two or several months, just depending on when the when the board gets back together to approve these approve these new grants. And and a lot of times, the employees will come back and say, "Hey, where's my grant agreement? Where's my grant agreement? Where's my grant?" Well, technically, it hasn't actually been granted and approved yet by the board. Great point, Gail. Um, just to add a little bit to that as well as the coordination within within the department. So, um, an example I like to kind of go back to would be the expense piece because you know finance is always waiting for the expense to to kind of get finalized so they could go ahead and begin calculating whether it's a monthly or quarterly report um, so the the fact that the the admin while they're doing the grants and kind of communicating and coordinating with the finance department that the grants are not ready and you could begin kind of pulling uh, expense and calculating expense is uh, something that we've seen you know, b being a big issue. So now let's go ahead and just dive into our first case study. Um, this is was a fairly large client. Uh, with as you can see, they've had 12 years of history um, worldwide. So there was a lot of international, uh, you know, issues that came up. They used stock options annually and. Uh, very frequently, so it was definitely something that was extensively used. Uh, you know, as as Gil men mentioned, it it was a retention tool. It allowed the the company to make sure that the employees were engaged and showed care within within the company. And I'd just like to add that these these case studies these case studies that we're mentioning are actually all real life scenarios. Um, we're not just making stuff up. This is things that we've seen. Um, obviously, we're not going to share the name of our, the client with you, but uh, these are, in fact, real-life scenarios. And probably the, the biggest point on this um, would actually be the fourth bullet point under the equity background, It's and that's they never recorded stock-based comp, and that's kind of where we came in um, to help them get, get that ready. So within each of their you know historical years, some of the, the issues that we noticed was it was just inefficient and, and slow process to kind of catch them up just because it was just, there was such an extensive amount of data um, and so many different different things to compare to just being able to tie things to to each other was you know definitely difficult and challenging um, also in terms of the bandwidth obviously they a main reason they might have not not have been getting this done was just Things were moving moving so fast. They didn't know who was doing what, and there was a total miscommunication within the company. Is that correct, Yusuf? Exactly. So, kind of where where we came in, or you know, what what an outsourcing um, support project might might entail was the implementation of a cloud, you know cloud based getting things cleaned out. I like the word scrubbed because we, we, we did come in and through 12 years of equity events, you're obviously going to find a lot of things that sometimes don't make sense, might have not have been recorded properly or were treated, you know, not as they such have, uh, should have been. Right. And a lot of times it happens too that people come and go or leave or change roles. And there's always 
that lack of information of, hey, what happened 10 years ago, right? And even if you've been there for 12 years straight, you know, obviously you're not going to remember all the details of all the minute things that have happened within maybe an individual grant, for example. And that's where a lot of our services come into play to reconcile and look at that information and, and, and making sure that it's correct and accurate. And again, as, as well as you could document things, um, it's always best to do things in the moment. And I think having to go back a dozen years and try and recreate it uh, was, is definitely difficult and not very sufficient and, or efficient and probably will open you up to a lot of issues uh, going forward. So through, through our process, uh, we were able to go ahead and kind of give them a three-year deta detail on the technical accounting of, of all the entries that were created. We went ahead and prepared all their footnotes and, and disclosures and began outsourcing fully through all the equity activities that they're experiencing um, presently and, and going forward. So all in all, all the results that came through was definitely we were able to go ahead and identify issues and resolve them. Um, so even though that, you know, something may have done incorrectly five or six years ago, we were able to go ahead, true things up and make sure that uh, we, we did account for it the way it was supposed to be. Uh, later on in the presentation, we're, we're going to cover some modifications. I think that's something that is important to be done in the moment. And, and while you're, you're caught up in a, and on a, an equity-based um, platform, it will make things easier on you to do so. So it's, it's nice to, to have that capability and um, be caught up. And, you know, it's another thing would be the process development and the automation of it. So it's something that we've been doing a lot lately where kind of documenting and creating expectations of, you know, who's doing what allows us to be efficient. And going forward, you know, things are done with, you know, a, a T plus three, whether it's, uh, you know, only a couple of days after the um, the event happens, but it's done in a timely manner. So whether it's the grant issuances or, or exercises. Right. It's really helping you to function more as a public company than a private company, even as you're private. So as Yusuf mentioned with the T plus three, a lot of times in the private company scenario, you don't have to meet those requirements, but our goal is to help you achieve those those requirements, or at least get within the boundaries of those requirements, so that as you as the company grows and you're preparing for either an IPO or or a or an M&A activity, that you're 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 acting as a you're you're behaving and acting as a public company, which will make the transition much smoother. And then just to add one more thing, I think it's the the last bullet point in, in reference to the cap table is something that I, I've seen a lot of. Uh, individuals enjoy in that, you know, sometimes a, a CFO might come and ask for um, an updated cap table as of a certain date. Uh, and since you are already caught up, the system's ready to go, you're able to go into whatever system you're on, pull an updated cap table and present it when, you know, if there's a board meeting coming up or whatever it may be. So just the fact that, you know, things are, are true and up to date allows you to, to be comfortable with providing anyone anything at any moment. And you bring up a really good point, Yusuf, is in regards to using the software, for example, for a cap table. Um, one of the requests that we see quite often coming in is asking for a request for cap table, obviously, but not, an, not a current cap table. Uh, one of the things that we see a lot of is coming back, hey, what was our cap table like three months ago or six months ago? And that's where the software really helps you in determining that because we can go in and utilize the software to run the cap table as a specific time um, in history to get you that information. So I, I did see a question come in re referencing, you know, what is a cap table? And it's primarily we're referencing a um, the ownership percentage or the ownership uh, table where it's going to reflect who owns what shares, whether it's uh, preferred or common. So if it's, uh, you know, if you've caught up on your cap table, it will allow you to show any uh, historical investments that were made where people are, are owning shares or 
up-to-date transactions like exercises or restricted award vestings that will then translate to the cap table and show what shares are um, currently owned by the employees. Well, it looks like there's another question that came in too. Um, would you suggest that a startup company should automate with a tool right away or use an attorney? So I think that really that question is really dependent on <clears throat> on number one is is number uh, your law firm. Does your law firm have that capability or the expertise to manage your equity program and and manage your your cap table, for example? So um, again, some some law firms do have that capability capability, and others do not. So it really dependent on that, and we could uh, we can have a side conversation about that to talk about that in, in more details. And then also within um, just to spend a couple seconds on this slide, just within this client, we we experienced a lot of major um, uh, uh, events historically. So. Other than just change in personnel, which is something was e was easily to, to keep track of, I would say there was, um, you know, the merger was, we had an experience of merger where it's definitely a um, difficult and time-consuming um, event. And the fact that, you know, the system was, was caught up allowed us to help them to move forward and move forward fairly quickly. So, uh well, the good thing was they didn't have any problems with the equity piece of the merger. So at least that part was very clean for them, right? Correct. So kind of to kind of go back to the items that we've already cut, we've already covered. And again, at the, at the onset of this was discussing, you know, putting things in, in writing and having procedures and, um, touching on some of the things Gail already mentioned in terms of the valuations and having a standard of when the valuations are going to be done. Also, the, you know, if there's exercises, uh, pro that's probably something we could touch on, on during our, our next few uh, case studies. But just getting th these uh, documented and having a you know, step-by-step process to get this done was uh, a definitely a recommended and now uh, fully used uh, procedure that that we're going forward with. So I'm going to go ahead and just pass this on to to Nikki, who's going to cover the next case study. Great, thanks, Yusuf. So our next case study here, we call it reconciling the past. I'll also call it our spreadsheet case. Um, it's a situation where we had a, a fairly large company, a tech com based company. Um, f over 500 employees, extensive use of stock options, so um, quite a lot given 500 plus employees. Um, they had multiple corporate events along the way, so we had some acquisitions, um, potential IPO coming up, and um, ESPP rollout as well. Um, they also had um, quite a bit of option activity, historical activity, and of course all of this was tracked in a spreadsheet which of course, nothing wrong with the spreadsheet, but once you get to a certain point of growth, which this company did, it was um, not quite um, transitional for them. Um, so major pain points they had, of course, obviously data was tracked in the spreadsheet. Um, they weren't, there was currently no, at that point, no software they were making use of uh, to manage their stock option plan. Um, uh, they were using a third party, but it was being used inefficiently. Um, they also didn't have a, a, a good set of controls in place as far as managing their equity plan. Um, the third party was limited in their knowledge of equity. Um, so they're getting, you know, really a portion of what they really needed. Um, again, and they were doing a, their, their stock based comp. Besides managing the data and activity of the plan, they were using Excel for their calculation stock based comp. Um, you know, and the assumption with all the history that they had was that everything was accurate, which we find out that it wasn't. So what's the issue with spreadsheets? So spreadsheets are a great way to start. Um, if you're small and pretty agnostic with the way you're granting options, everything's all the same, same vesting schedules, um, same grant dates, uh, no modifications, everything's peachy, and you have 10 employees and 10 options, spreadsheets are great, you know, save you some money there. Um, it's, if you have a larger plan, obviously it's where you need to start with the data, 
Um, but moving into the realm of equity and complicated um, reporting, it's not um, scalable. Um, so as far as what you know you need to do for stock-based compensation, you know, doing the calculations themselves are quite complicated. Um, so it's really prone to human error. So uh, you know, someone put in a formula two years ago. Does it still apply um, when you're moving into your next fiscal year? Um, do you need to tweak it? Is it really you know um, accurate at this point? Um, you know, the audit trail, of course, you know, is okay. If you're very, um, you know, ritualistic about your Excel spreadsheets and you have saved several copies over the years and you have a, a good transition, sure, it might be great for auditors, but that's, again, dependent on no human error at all, which is usually not the case. One of the things that I think that we see quite a bit of issues with when we look at our clients that use spreadsheets or are com coming off of spreadsheets is really that rounding issue that we run into. Um, a lot of times there's very inconsistency in, in, in the rounding where, you know, one set of grants is rounded up, the others are rounded down, some are, are, are kind of the, the rounding is pushed out to the last investing tranches. Um, and that's one of the really kind of the major disadvantages of using that spreadsheet is that consistency. Is that correct? Maybe? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, you may try to create an all encompassing formula. Um, it's probably going to be several li lines long and you bring in the auditors or even just a new person to take on the spreadsheet. And, and how are they really going to follow that formula? Um, it's just not manageable. And right. I'm sure you can, I'm sure everyone out there, I think we've got about 40% of people that are not using software, I would assume probably on Excel or some other, you know, basic format um, of tracking information. Um, so it's definitely, you know, something as you're moving forward, um, deciding on where you want to go from your spreadsheet. Right. And as, as you go through over time, as you mentioned, I'm sure that the spreadsheet gets handed over from one individual to another or from one role to another. And that's where a lot of these complications come into play, where there's multiple hands touching this, this spreadsheet. And just over time, it, it just it just gets it gets really complicated and just loses that consistency of what the original purpose of this was for. Exactly. I think just quickly to add to Gil's point is we've seen a lot or I've seen a lot of um, companies where someone might leave, you know, they, they set up the spreadsheet and they're no longer with the company. And we go back and try and recon reconcile something that occurred in 2013. But the current user of the spreadsheet has no idea what that was, you know, why it was done. A lot of times it might have been just a manual override. So the kind of the move into a software system allows you to to understand that more. And then also I, I would say just one more point it is just the audit trail. Um, if a lot of times I'm sure you've experienced it is where the auditors come in and request you to change something. And while, you know, you agree with them, you're going to the have to In the heat of go, the moment, you're changing it. Exactly. And then, and then you forget about it afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, I think just the simplicity of, of making any changes instead of a you know going through a spreadsheet and making sure it flows through accurately um, is another benefit of kind of moving away from the spreadsheet. Yeah, so what did we do in this situation and what should you do? Um, so in this case, the best approach was going to a cloud-based um, software tool. Um, get every, all the data on there. Uh, equity, and of course, cap table, which uh, Yusuf had spoken to before. Um, this was a, a, an aggregate of eight years of equity events that was once managed on, soft, on uh, Excel. Uh, so this was allowing for, you know, providing for audit support for the first time, um, you know, audit on, on this system. Um, it was automated. So we have reports we could run. We had um, SOC 1 reports through the software um, vendor. Um, there was uh, ability to train the new stakeholders on the system. So there is online education um, through the software vendor, as well as our team's own um, knowledge. Um, we were able to do live training sessions. Right. It's really rebuilding that history from eight years ago and putting it into the application. Exactly. Yeah. So the results. Um, obviously, improve financial compliance. So during the process of reconciling data to get it onto the software, um, you know, we found holes, um, inconsistencies. 
Um, so this was a, the, these were able to be resolved. Um, we were able to, you know, to get the company to put, get to a point where they could manage their equity plan internally. Um, so this is a case, and you'll see other cases where we, we have situations where um, managing internally was not a, a good option. Um, but in this case, they were able to have internal resources, uh, you know, working directly on the equity plan and management moving forward. Um, once it was on the software, they could run expense reports on a monthly basis or however often as they wanted um, on the fly. So the data was in there, was reconciled, it was ready to go. Um, it was also updated for stock-based compensation assumptions. So um, again, it was something system level that you could change on the fly and update quickly. Um, so you know, as a result, we could complete the equity footnotes um, and, and of course, you know, appease the auditors. I think the really key here is get you through your audit. Yes. I think that's really <laughs> the big takeaway of that. Is. Yeah. So big pain point that was resolved. Um, and then from there, once they were reconciled, we could move forward on a clean system, everything looking good and um, continue the support and keeping them up to, up to date and um, accurate. And some additional activities that were involved with this client in particular, um, they, as I mentioned, they had an, they wanted to have an internal resource. So, uh, you know, they, they hired a stock administrator specifically um, to maintain the system. Um, they, th through the system, they were able to use paperless granting. So the system included a portal for all grantees to log in, review grant agreements, sign them, um, process exercise size, exercises and process them. Um, they're also, you know, they, this was a pre-IPO, so they're able to use a system for reporting, um, pr preparation for the IPO, um, S1, um, equity footnote support, um, and this, as well as um, rolling out ESPP. So the software had an, a capability for ESPP as well. All right, now it's time to make sure that you're all paying attention. We got into the polling question. How, and the question is, how often do you grant equity awards? Is that once a year, twice a year, quarterly, monthly, or on a, a different schedule? Um, so we'd like to get everyone to vote in here so you can make sure you get your CE credit. And we've got just over 50% of the folks have voted. So um, again, let us know how often do you make those equity grants in a calendar year? Uh, some really interesting results coming in, Barry. Yeah. Okay, and it looks like we've got just about everybody. So we'll go ahead and close that poll. What have you found, Bill? So you have 32% that was once a year, 24% quarterly, and 32% other. I'm very intrigued by what the other is. I would imagine it would just be on a new hire basis or a retention basis where the need to create an equity comp program you know, to bring someone on board or to retain someone. But it, it'd be interesting to find out more information about what the other really means. So uh, maybe after this uh, webinar, I'll reach out to you folks to find out some more additional information. All right, and then moving forward, we've got another case study. Awesome. So kind of a good transition from our, our last polling question uh, into this specific client. Uh, a fairly new client, I would say only four, three to four years in terms of his, you know, history of granting and issuing shares. So the the issues that would come up with, you know, a, a, a baby client like this would is a little different than a, a client that would have 12 years of history. And I would say is just making sure that you're 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 issuing and you're planning accordingly. So a lot of times equity awards, just like we've we've talked about are, are used to incentivize the, the employees and make sure that they're engaged. So while you, while you want to do that, you want to make sure that you're putting them in their, the best position possible. So that would mean using appropriate vesting or the type of awards and then the tax treatment for those awards. So um, definitely you do want to pay attention to, to not make the mistake of just issuing what other other companies may be issuing or what you think is the kind of the trend of of the system so um, that was probably the the biggest thing in terms of 
our our working with this client was making sure that we were issuing the the correct types of, of awards. Um, other planning mistakes obviously would be termination schedules. Uh, a lot of times in the early stages of a company, you're going to have uh, frequent turnover where people are coming in and out. You want to make sure that you're tracking those uh, accordingly. And then also planning out not just your you know your ne your next one to two years, but your your look forward. You want to make sure that if you are a company that's eyeing that IPO or you know a, a potential first audit, you are definitely putting yourself in a position to to succeed in doing so. Um, also, just using the platform for future needs. So making sure you're just not on, you're not jumping into a system that's just going to assist you maybe in that first year. You want to make sure that's going to be able to be flexible and allow you to do certain uh, events or acquisitions or whatever it may be in the future. So um, again, already kind of touched base on on this client, but. Um, one thing that I had not mentioned was kind of the rolling ESPP uh, window, which is something that has been coming up a lot recently with our our, our public clients. You know, whether they've been IPO'd for uh, quite some time or just recently, um, the the major pain points for a client that you know that's still pretty early is just not reconciling. Uh, you always kind of consistently feel that you have time to reconcile, but before you know it, three or four years has gone by, you have not reconciled, and once you do get to the point of reconciling, you know, you've, some things have fallen through the crack. Um, but other, other issues that we've touched on are modifications. You want to make sure that historically things have been accounted for, and typically that goes back to either just lack of bandwidth for someone to go back and uh, do their research and make sure that something was treated properly or just knowledge about the stock-based comp and what requirements kind of go into it. Uh, so kind of jumping into what we did for this client is set up all their Black Shoals assumptions. So we went back, made sure that these awards were uh, expensed properly, they were valued properly. Uh, we also did some analysis. So whether it was a peer group or forfeiture rate analysis, for, for, fortunately, the forfeiture rate isn't something that is going to be required going forward, but um, kind of historically that was something that we were able to do for them. And then also life to date expense. So they had never recorded expense. We went back, we made sure that things were um, expensed accurately, and then we went, took that another step further and allowed them to set up their footnotes and disclosures for both their financials and their S1. I think one of the things that we didn't write in this particular case was in this particular client, we also gave them a lot of guidance as to what to expect, as this is a lot of times on their executive team, this is the first time they've gone through some of these things, and just really working with them and, and prepping them and making them aware of some of the things that they wouldn't have ordinarily thought of. Correct, yeah, and that's definitely something that uh, gave, the fact that they're an outsourced client allowed us to kind of take a bigger role in this and setting up the processes and things that, you know, that, that we've already seen that they've not, maybe were a little short-sighted and didn't see coming. Right, exactly. So in this particular case, like we mentioned, this company did go IPO. So there are a lot of consequences that happen with that is how do you properly communicate with your employees about that? You know, have you gone out and done some brokerage research for the execution of your stock? So items like that, that comes up that, you know, if you're an outsourced client, you know, when we start talking, we get a good understanding of kind of where you guys are heading to. So just, again, additional activities. Um, I, I think performance awards is something that we haven't really touched on, but what was a, a key factor for this, just that you want to make sure that the performance awards are, are being valued and expensed accurately, being recorded properly. Again, you're doing this to, the, to benefit the employee. But again, you want to make sure that you've um, accounted for it properly. Um, so I would say that would fall into the, you know, unique or unique awards or the complex valuations. Uh, this this slide is more of a takeaway slide. Um, it it kind of gives a, a good breakdown of where you might be uh, when comparing to to your IPO um, goal date. 
So just to kind of point out a couple of things in, in each of the sections, when you're looking at a, a 24 to 12 month, um, you know, look forward to your IPO, I, I think what this would be good to, to do is begin to kind of plan and put in the processes in place and um, establish your, you know, your guidance, establish your, your goals and, and what it may be. So um, also and then now your 12 to one month prior to IPO is to kind of begin to build your reports, um, make sure that you know you're putting things together in order, and um, not not really waiting until the moment of to to put it together. Right at that 12 to one month period is kind of really when things really start to happen. You know, from that earlier phase of the 24 to 12 months where you're doing a lot of the planning, um, the 12 to the 12 to one month period is really now starting to generate the report, generate the, the, the information that you need to do the filings. Correct. And then finally, just post IPO. I think this is where uh, one of the most important things is the communication externally to your employees, letting them know, you know when they would are able to either exercise or pull um, statements and whatnot. Right. A lot of times, you know, during this phase right now, there's a lot of excitement going on. Your employees are super happy. They're, they're amped up of what's going on. And it's really critical for you at this point to let them know kind of what to expect, you know, how long these lockout periods are, and just really keep them informed about their equity. Now on to case study four, Nikki. All right. Thanks, Yusuf. Um, so this case is kind of a, a good comparison to the one I, I previously spoke to. Um, it was, it's, and we'll get into more detail on the company in the next slide, but pretty much a company that was overwhelmed with um, the equity side of things. Um, they just didn't have enough resources to deal with it, um, and not enough uh, knowledge in that area. Um, they were, they had software, but they weren't really making full use of it. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. All right, so you have here uh, another tech company. Um, they had, in, as far as background, quite a bit of um, activity, uh, reorganization. Um, they had foreign grants of uh, overseas employees. Uh, they had the software, but again, I mentioned in not fully utilizing it. Uh, limited, sm a very small finance team. Um, and they were using a, a service provider, um, but not to its, uh, you know, to a full extent, um, again, a limited service provider. Um, so they were limited in bandwidth. Uh, the preparing for an audit, you know, that they hadn't yet come across before. They're doing prior years and current years. Um, so the system wasn't being. They weren't trained on it. They weren't um, at a point where they could fully use it for the audit. Yeah, we see that quite often too with a lot of our clients. Is you know, unless you're going to be in the system on a regular basis, you're not going to remember it. And that's one of the benefits that we help our clients with. Is we're in these systems. We're doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're able there to be there to support you if, you know, if you need to go in there and run a report, you don't remember what it is or whatever the case is, we can definitely help you with that. Yeah, so what we did, and, and luckily, you know, they were already on software, so we could run with that we reconcile the system. So we, we maximize the software to its full potential. Um, we use, made use of functionality, made use of um, the system for the expense calculations. Um, we were able to read to prior years that were already, um, already booked and, and, and reconciled to it in the system. Um, and then we were able to move forward with that. Um, again, we were able to, to produce um, equity footnotes as a result. Um, and because of the limited bandwidth of this company, they fully outsourced um, all equity management activities. Okay. Um, the results, inaccurate data was resolved. Uh, we're now clean and able to move forward accurately. Um, the, the software was fully utilized again. We could um, move forward, add new activity, uh, reconcile and move forward cleanly. Um, and then of course, the reconciliation as far as coordinating amongst the board meeting minutes, um, getting all the activity from that onto the system, coordinate with HR, um, and maintain the cap table as well as uh, prepare for future audits. 
um, some additional activities. Uh, so they had some modifications, um, some things that we were able to partially recon reconcile in the system and or, uh, you know, to account for um, some things where we had to do some external calculations. Um, uh, this was, you know, a great thing of the outsourcing where, again, their team didn't have the full knowledge of the accounting. Uh, so we could come in and look at these complex modifications and, and assist with, um, you know, what the, the good results should be. Uh, and because they were also granting to foreign employees, we were able to make use of the system for reporting in both FAS and IFRS. Um, so, you know, what are the kind of takeaways from this? You make the upfront investment. Um, so th this company did, they, they, they bought the software, they just weren't, you know, making use of it as much as, you know, as, as, as well as they could. Um, the, you know, making sure you have processes in place um, so as I talked about, you know, coordinating with HR, board of directors, um, making sure the equity or the outsourced team is in constant communication with them, um, making sure we're not missing anything. Um, and the focus on value added tasks is, is really saying, you know, high level to low level. Let's start reconciling everything on a whole, look at total numbers, and then we'll get into the more complex uh, modifications and changes moving forward. Okay, and our third polling question. So we're looking at what is your equity grant acceptance process? Do you offer paper grant agreements and a manual signature? Do you have online acceptance via the equity software program that you use? An online acceptance outside of an equity software program? None of the above or you're not sure how you're managing that grant acceptance process. So again, I'm sure that's an important part of the entire documentation uh, for equity. So we want to make sure we get the audience to weigh in here on their um, processes. It looks like we've got the majority of you who have voted. So we're going to go ahead and uh, close that poll. I am so glad that no one chose the last one. Because if you chose that last one, I would be seriously concerned that you're not sure how your equity grants are being distributed. Uh, the poll results are 35% is paper grant or manual, uh, manual, 30% uh, online grant acceptance via an equity software, 17% online acceptance outside of the equity system, and 17% of none of the above. Okay, we're going to just get, uh, close out here on some other common issues that, that folks face with their equity programs. Thanks, Mary. Um, uh, this is probably something we've kind of covered uh, sporadically throughout the, the webinar, but modifications is time and time again a challenging topic to where you can't really not treat each modification, you know, the same as the, the previous one. So just to spend a minute on this is, you definitely need to do your homework to make sure that you know what what the modification you know that occurred is is about and typically you know it's it's we know that a modification would be just a change in terms of the conditions of an award but what does that mean uh, what change and what, how does that affect both the vesting of the option and then the expense side and I, that definitely you know the expense side would be something that you would need to spend time and doing the homework and making sure that the treatment uh, pre and post uh, modification is done accurately. And this is just kind of another maybe takeaway uh, slide, but common areas of mistakes are typically, we, we've seen a lot of ISO non-qual splits to where, you know, the, the 100,000 uh, K limit is, um, you know, not taken into effect. Therefore, the, the ISO doesn't get split accurately. Uh, or it could have been disqualified ISOs. One thing that we've seen recently with all of the restricted awards is making sure that the 83B election is, is made and that will affect some of the, the tax consequences that are associated with it. And then some tips and rules is definitely do the calculation right after the grant and document. So that would be, again, in the moment, making sure you're doing it in a timely manner, timely manner to make sure that um, Anyone that's affected is is up to speed, and that typically affects the expense in the finance department. So, for those of you that may be um, dealing with international employees, um, 
I think most people are aware that obviously taxes overseas versus U.S. taxes are and um, applicable laws um, will be different for different people um, depending on their their base country. Uh, so when you are granting uh, options to these sorts of employees, make sure you're reviewing the international laws and also the associated tax liabilities. Um, oftentimes people will just assume to grant ISOs to uh, uh, foreign employees and assume that this would be applicable to them. They would be able to get the um, tax benefits that U.S. employees would. Um, the, that may not be the case, and usually it's not the case. Um, also, make sure you're coordinating with your payroll, your HR. Uh, make sure that you, if you don't have the resources that have the knowledge of international tax laws and liabilities, um, that you, you find a resource. You can go external, um, outsource, um, or bring on new people. All right, and our final polling question to wrap things up. And this is a reminder that you can enter in a question of your own for our presenters. If we run out of time, they will email you a response. Um, but our last polling question here is, what mistakes have you seen in your own equity programs? Um, do they apply to the process, modifications, taxes, or all of the above, or none of the above? So I think it'd be quite awesome if you haven't seen any mistakes, that's great. Um, but we would like everybody to be able to kind of weigh in and, and let us know kind of where you've seen trip ups, uh, either in process, modification, taxes, all of the above or none of the above. And don't worry, we're not going to call you out on it. Right. So don't worry about that. Okay. And with that, we'll go ahead and close the poll. Wow. Interesting results. So 26% of the poll audience says that it's processes, 9% say modification. 22% says tax, and 48% says all of the above. So that leads me to believe that there's a lot of opportunities out there for us to kind of help you on doing any of those and, and, and giving you that advice that you need to move forward. So that really leads us to talking about what can Arm Nino do to help you and, um, and, and how we can you know, use the value of, of, of our expertise and our knowledge to to, to help you streamline a lot of these processes. So these four categories up here on, on, the, on the presentation really captures the, in a nutshell, what we're really doing here on the equity management team. So equity administration and cap table management, obviously it's what we've been talking about all along, providing you with the best practices and the know how to properly manage um, your stock option or equity program and also the cap tables. Um, uh, implementation of software. So again, as we've really highlighted kind of in this whole presentation, the use of software, utilizing software to make lives easier. And again, this is back to my Jerry McGuire uh, statement of helping us help you in, in picking the right software, utilizing the software that you're currently on properly and getting the full usage of that software. Um, accounting and stock-based compensation, obviously with these equity programs, you are you you have a, a accounting um, responsibility to uh, to figure out the the expenses of these awards and and, and grants and uh, we can definitely offer a service to help you on that and then and then lastly the valuation of your stock and equity awards and this is really geared towards the private companies of 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 getting that 409a valuation and making sure that your 409a uh, valuation can can be accurate and stand up to the change in times and making sure that you're, you're, you're properly serviced. Uh, additional outsource packages that we, we offer, uh, it's, again, it's the full outsource of the administration. Uh, we can also kind of carve out pieces of services that you, are, that you need. We don't have to service all of it, so if you only need us to do the accounting, uh, we can also handle that. Um, one of the very interesting things that we offer is this customer support where we will offer tier uh, first tier customer support to your participants so you know so we can answer your employee questions about their stock options and about your plants. All right, well, thank you, Gil and Nikki and Yusuf. that was very informative. and uh, just to reiterate for the audience during the webinar, we covered issues that clients face when dealing with equity management how to overcome those hurdles with internal and external solutions, and some real-life scenarios that highlight successful approaches. 
So we want to invite you, of course, to um, we're, run, we're running out of time for submitting questions, but in the exit poll you can submit questions. And then also we do have up here the emails for each of our presenters. So if you'd like to contact them directly, you can certainly send an email and our very informative team will get back to you about your equity concerns. So thank you again for joining on the email and thank you to our presenters.